Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Criminal Insider. Perhaps some of you might recognize me, Tony, from a story written by a current prisoner. However, here on Criminal Insider, we like to do things just a little bit differently. We're going to go ahead and highlight and talk about a fascinating article that revolves around none other than the notorious Mexican Mafia, in particular, a member by the name of Cartoon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a tendency for this in this criminal world, in this criminal lifestyle, that when one mobster rises to the top, another one seems to fall. And such is the case, in this case in particular, mobsters taking down mobsters. It is not out of normal. It is completely normal, in fact, for a mafia member to take out another mafia member. So here we have Cartoon, a leader of the Cantaranas gang, the singing frogs that's been a well-established neighborhood, a barrio that goes back since the 50s and the 60s. We have several different cliques that fall within the Cantaranas gang. We have the Kingsmen, we have the Seekers, we got the Parkside, we got the Locals, we got the Viejos, and several other different factions that fall within the Cantaranas gang. What makes this gang a little interesting in particular is that its gang members thrive in warring neighborhoods such as Santa Fe Springs and Whittier. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it ain't no secret who's controlled and dominated and has had a heavy influence and a heavy presence in that area for the past few decades. And, and, and it belongs to none other than another notorious Mexican Mafia member by the name of DG, David Garvalon, also known as Spider. Now, this individual Spider is as cold as they come. He is cold, calculated, and callous. Now, this individual Spider, from my understanding, is responsible for the homicide of a, uh, of a Nuestra Familia associate way back in 1986 when he hit him with the Indian manufactured weapon and personally took his life. Now, he was assigned this task to murder this Norteño by another Mexican Mafia member, a notorious Mexican Mafia member by the name of Bebito Alvarez. Now, this individual Spider-Man has a web of family members that's fully entrenched in this criminal lifestyle. We're going to go ahead and start off with this brother, Little Spider who was recently put up to be a member of the mob, but for whatever reason, was denied access into the mafia. Then we have his sister, who was recently involved in the indictment for being his direct line of communication and being responsible for his dealings out here on the street. She was 70-something years old, and from my understanding, she got sentenced to 10 or 15 years in federal prison for being his direct line of communication out here on the streets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that pretty much is a life sentence. Now, when we hear the name Galvadon, Immediately, a name that pops up into my head is Cinta Galvadon. Now, we already know who Cinta Galvadon is. She is the victim of none other than the notorious Rene Boxer Enriquez, who was recently paroled from prison. Now, what makes this cold, what makes this really, really twisted, it's not the simple fact that Rene Boxer Enriquez was recently re released on parole after murdering Cinta Galvadon. That's not what makes it cold and twisted. What makes him cold and twisted is that Cinta Galvalon was the wife of Little Spider. Yes, Cinta Galvalon was the wife of Little Spider. Anybody can get hit, and that is proof that anybody can get got being involved in that criminal lifestyle. That one right there really sickens me. You know what I'm saying? So Spider, man... He's made a handful of members. He also made another member by the name of Woody. Now, this individual, Woody, also a, a, a member of the Santa Fe Springs gang, is a cold, calculated killer himself. And from my understanding, he was responsible for another homicide of a Mexican mafia member by the name of Victor Victorio Murillo, a mafia member. This happened out there in the city of Acelia, which brings a whole nother slew of questions. And what are these mafia members doing out there in the city of Acelia, knowing that's Northern California? This happened in the 90s, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the Cantaranas gangman has always had a very heavy mob influence, man. Not only that, man, they go at it with several other different values, man. They're surrounded by Norwalk, Bell Gardens, Montebello, Whittier, Downey. Pico Rivera, and several other different gangs, man. And each of those cities have 10 to 12 clicks within those cities, man. Barrios, killers, man. So we're going to go ahead and dive into this fascinating article, ladies and gentlemen. Please do yourself a favor and hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you for stopping by, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and dive right into this and waste no time whatsoever. Let's go. 
And just a quick article mention, since we're talking about the topic, the Cantaranas gang, we have this individual, Nino, Gerald Gonzalez, this tatted up, cold, intimidating individual who's responsible for the murder of his friend. What makes this a little weird is that this individual claims that he was instructed to go to a certain hotel where he found an envelope. Now, when he opened up this envelope, it, it came with instructions on to take out his friend. And he did exactly that, only to end up cooperating with authorities. That was just a quick article mention. Please hit that like and subscribe button. Let's dive right into this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this article was written by none other than that fascinating staff writer, Matthew Ornsveth at the Los Angeles Times, who has quickly become one of my favorite writers. I repeat it one more time, what you're about to listen to, it is not my work. It was written by Matthew Ornsveth at the Los Angeles Times, ladies and gentlemen. The headliner reads, after unusual trial, Mexican mafia member sentenced to life in prison. For cutting short the life of a fellow Mexican mafia member in a hell of bullets, a judge ruled Monday that Jose Luis Losa should spend the rest of his own in a federal prison. Losa from Whittier was convicted of murder, racketeering, and other crimes after an unusual trial in August in which Losa himself testified for two days. It was an unprecedented departure, law enforcement official says, from the Mexican mafia historical refusal to acknowledge in the courtroom such an organization exists, let alone discuss its politics on the witness stand. The trial was a window into what is arguably the most powerful criminal organization in Southern California. It demonstrated how the Mexican mafia, most of its membership is incarcerated, holds the region's Latino street gang under its sway through fear, exacting a tax from virtually every dollar they make and using their members as foot soldiers for the syndicate. Rosa, 41, was born in Imperial Valley town of Brawley, the son of a machinist and a warehouse employee. He moved as a child to Whittier, and by the age of 13, Rosa testified he had been jumped to the Cantaranas, a street gang born in the 1940s in a neighborhood in Santa Fe Springs. So here we have, man, Cartoon moving to Santa Fe Springs at a very young age, man, coming from a hardworking family. One was a machinist, one was a warehouse employee, like several Hispanic families, man, crossing over to try to give their families, you know, better life, better opportunity that they never had. Now, unfortunately, another Hispanic, a Mexican mafia member, did lose their life in this incident. But that's not the only tragedy, ladies and gentlemen. And we're talking about Mexican mafia member Dominic Solo Gonzalez out of the San Fernando Valley. Now, the tragedy behind the act is that his younger brother, Little Solo, was murdered because of mistaken identity. They thought that he was his brother. So, man, um, tales like that really saddened me, man. When, when when people get killed, when they got... Not that he had nothing to do with, but the, but the simple fact that it was a case of mistaken identity. You know what I'm saying? At 19, Losa pleaded guilty to attempted murder and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. After fleeing from facility to facility, he was transferred in 2001 to Pelican Bay State Prison Security Housing Unit, or the SHU, a wing reserved for the prison's most dangerous inmates and where until a landmark 2015 settlement reformed the unit where the prison and Mexican Mafia members were held. Inside the shoe, Losa met a revered figure within his gang, David Galvadon, a Mexican mafia member who has controlled Cantaranas from his prison cell since the late 1980s. Law informant authorities say he has been incarcerated since 1984. Galvadon was the first one to sit down and talk to me about joining the Mexican mafia. Losa testified he was in his mid-20s then. Galvadon, more than 20 years his senior, a made man since 1985. The Mexican mafia member has about 150. 40 members drawn from Latino street gangs in Southern California. Law enforcement authorities say because its members maintain control of their gangs after becoming made men, the Mexican mafia's influence extends beyond the prisons that hold most of its membership. In 2011, Losa was released from Pelican Bay. He took a job at a linen service in Chino, then a trucking company in Ontario. He made decent money, as much as $5,500 a month, prosecutors said. But even as he made short haul deliveries for Gardner Trucking so as not to stray beyond the 50 mile radius imposed by his parole, Losa was trafficking drugs, overseeing the extortion of dealers in Cantarana's territory, and ensuring the proceeds flowed to Garbadon, according to evidence presented during his trial. This is playing out exactly how I've imagined that's paid out time and time again, man. Here we have an up and coming gangster, man, striving at 19 years old, catches a 15 year sentence for attempted murder to, to only meet a founding father of his very own gang. Someone 20, 30 years his senior, and it's crazy because 
more than likely, most of these individuals have never met their Amr founding fathers. You know what I'm saying? They've always heard about them. They probably even done dirt for them. They probably spoke on the phone. They probably sent money to them or, or made money for them. However, but to actually physically meet them and shake their hand and have a face-to-face -face conversation, more than likely, a lot of these individuals have not done that. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these uh, founding fathers, these MM members, have been incarcerated for decades. You know, such as the case for Spider, who's been incarcerated since the 80s. So here we go. You know, Cartoon ends up at Pelican Bay. He becomes a made man. He gets released and lands a $5,500 trucking job. Hey, you know, that's that's a good paying job. That's eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 a week. That's more than a, a sustainable wage, man, to be able to feed you, yourself, and your family, man, and give yourself a decent lifestyle, man, uh, a good lifestyle, the legit way. Now, unfortunately, as we see, man, he was still functioning. He was still continuing to do dirt. So we're going to go ahead and continue reading off and see how this plays out. As one of the Mexican mafia members who lived outside of prison, Losa was expected to handle mafia business on the streets, including in early 2016, the issue of Dominic Solo Gonzalez, according to witnesses and evidence presented at trial. Gonzalez grew up in Pacoima, the stepson of Frank Sapo Fernandez, a Mexican mafia member who was serving a life sentence at the federal penitentiary in Florence, Colorado. Gonzalez, who spent much of his life in prison, was inducted into the Mexican Mafia at the Colorado Penitentiary and released in 2015. Almost immediately, witnesses for both the prosecution and the defense said Gonzalez began trying to stake a claim in the San Fernando Valley, which was divided at the time primarily among four Mexican Mafia members. Members collect taxes or extortionate cuts from the proceeds of criminal activity in areas under their control. Remarkably, Thomas T. Bug Moreno, an active member of the Mexican Mafia, testified in Losa's defense and described this taxation system to the jury. Let's just say like in my neighborhood, if somebody's doing something they're illegal, then I usually get something from whatever they're doing, whatever it may be, Moreno said. Whether it's credit card scam, whether it's selling drugs, whatever, I get a percentage of it. If the Mexican mafia member were to send an underling to collect from another made man's territory, Moreno explained, you tell him to go, you know, get the hell out of there. You don't belong there, go. And usually they go. And what would happen, a prosecutor asked, if they didn't? Oh, he's going to leave, Moreno said. He leaves. There's never been nobody that doesn't leave. T-Bug Moreno, a Mexican mafia leader of Barrio Norwalk, was stipulating to the judge that, hey, you know what? Basically, they do get a percentage of whatever's generated throughout, you know, their environment. Whatever illegal activity is conducted in their area, they basically get a little cut from it. Now, what, what also came to as a surprise to me personally was to find out that the person that was murdered, Solo Gonzalez, that his father... His stepfather, excuse me, was a Mexican mafia member himself. Now that I just sit back and I try to think, like, damn, that that must have been some type of weird relationship, you know, of some type of weird family environment, you know. I can only imagine, and it's very unfortunate how some people just take these paths. Mexican mafia members fume to one another that Gonzalez was toe stepping or enroaching on their territory. A government witness testified. Aaron Garcia, a Florencia Teresa gang member, said he facilitated conference calls with dozens of Mexican mafia members who dialed in from prison cells on contraband phones to discuss the matter. They came to an agreement, Garcia said. Gonzalez had to go. The evening of April 19th, 2016, Losa testified, he met Gonzalez at the El Jalisco restaurant in Bassett. Losa brought along a young Catalanas foot soldier, Leonardo Antolin. Gonzalez came with his right-hand man, Antonio Jupi Huron. After talking over Micheladas for over an hour, they paid the bill and shook hands. As they walked out the door, Losa pulled from his pocket a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. Antolin produced a Luger. Gonzalez was hit fatally in the head and in the chest. Huron shot back. In the crossfire, a woman, a woman eating at the restaurant's patio was hit six times. Losa shot in the leg, stumbled to his dog charger, and sped off, flinging his revolver onto the 605 freeway. One cold, calculated tactic. You know, I was once told by this individual, man, that he was always scared to go to these gatherings, that he was always scared to go to these meetings, these anime meetings only due to the simple fact that, man, you never know that if you're going to walk away from that meeting alive. You know what I'm saying? So here we have this cold tactic, man. Cartoon is tasked with this assignment, man, to take off solo. Now, he, he, he sets this whole thing up, man, and, and plays it well. He goes and has lunch with them, has drinks with them. They sit there for almost an hour. 
until finally, you know, he, he decides to pull out his weapon along with his partner and, 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 and do the thing. And they k end up killing and taking the life of, of another mafia member by the name of Solo. And, uh, man, that, that, like I said, that's a cold, twisted, manipulated time. Losa insisted he was hit first and shot Gonzalez only in self-defense. Carol Chen, the assistant U.S. attorney who prosecuted Losa, called the killing a cold-blooded, calculated assassination, one he committed at a rabid insecurity and the need to prove himself. Losa, among the most junior members of the Mexican Mafia, murdered Gonzalez to raise his standing in the organization. Another prosecutor wrote in court papers, pointing to the black hand, one of the syndicate symbols that was inked behind his left ear after the Gonzalez death. Losa was arrested a month after the killing. The lead defendant in a 51-person racketeering indictment aimed at dismantling Cantarranas. Over the next three years, agents would flip several of Losa's associates, including George Bouncer Gray, his close friend and cellmate, who testified that Losa bragged of putting a bullet in Gonzalez's head. Losa declined to address that court Monday. His fa Losa declined to address the court Monday. His family wept quietly as Chief U.S. District Judge Virginia A. Phillips sentenced him to life plus 30 years in prison. Losa nodded and appeared resigned to his fate, much as he had in a recorded phone call that Chen, the prosecutor, referenced at his trial. Chen asked Losa if he recalled saying, it is what it is, I mean, at a young age, this is what I wanted. I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be in the streets, and I stayed true. You said that, right? Yeah, Losa said. Wow, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another straight gangster job, man. And another gangster made the ultimate sacrifice, man. Took down a leader to become a leader. You know what I'm saying? Mobsters taking down mobsters. Man, it's, um, it's a very sick, cold, Twisted game, man. It's a very cold, twisted game, man. It's very unfortunate, man, that this um this young man, this 19-year-old, went down this path of, of becoming a gangster, man, and making that ultimate sacrifice, man. And by what I mean is ultimate sacrifice, man. Is I, I, me, in my personal perspective, I personally believe that you sacrifice everything else, whether it's women, whether it's cars, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, whether it's just doing everyday things as a human. You throw all that away to be that man of power. To me, ladies and gentlemen, it will never be worth it. And I hope you, you can see that it ain't worth it. It ain't worth it.